in composition, we have Cal Poly Slope. In closing government, we have Claremont. And in closing opposition, we have Cal Poly Slope. And the motion for the House today is this House believes that policies that may have significant environmental consequences should be subject to a veto by a Supreme Court of scientific experts. I will be your chair. I'm joined by two panelists. And I'd now like to welcome the Prime Minister to begin the case that stands in his name. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think I have to convince anybody in this room that we face a, like a severe and massive crisis. In fact, I think it's the most important crisis of our generation, actually of all time. We've never faced a crisis that has so far threatened the existence of humanity. Like, I do not need to stress, and I don't think I need to convince anybody that it's an issue. Like, at a point where the scientific community has concluded that if we don't do something in the very recent future, we are, as a nation, doomed. Our lifestyle is unsustainable, the way that we're going about everything is wrong, and it's just backed by this vicious cycle of having the profit, profit motives and people in government who, one, either don't understand what they're talking about, or two, have a much stronger incentive to perpetuate their place in government, that they don't care about the environment, they don't care about the future, and they'll let the next schmuck in office deal with it, right? That's the problem that exists. And it's not just a problem that happens in the United States. It's not just a problem that happens in, like, the EU. It happens literally everywhere. There's almost no country in the world that has instituted a policy like this. And so before I get into anything, let me actually talk about what the actual policy is and the semantics of it, right? I think a Supreme Court should be established in each country, or each developed country. And I'm going to tell you why it's developed uniquely, right? Like, I think there, the, the justices are, should be presidentially appointed Oh, wow. Appointed just like they do in the status quo, and it's not just in America, like a lot of other countries do. Um, they are generally, uh, experts are defined as people who have made significant contributions, peer-reviewed contributions, um, to their respective fields, so long as they are directly, tangi uh, directly tied to the environment. Like, so it's like earth sciences, climate change, uh, climate sciences, things like that, right? Um, these are recognized <coughs> experts in their field. They should be vetted the way that uh, the Supreme Court justices are, either through the governing or Supreme body. I'll take you after the model. Um, uh, they're vetted in the same way. They're asked severe questions or like you know hard questions. They're they're made sure that the right person for the job, um, and then you know they can veto it in case they're wrong. Um, the way that the actual process works is that largely um, you can kind of look at it the same way as uh, a policy being unconstitutional. First goes through the lower courts, like a group would challenge this policy, saying it's, uh, it's, it has harms to the environment, has greater impacts to society, therefore we shouldn't do it. Go through the lower courts, work its way up to that Supreme Court. And uh, essentially a veto, much like in the status quo, where something is deemed unconstitutional, means no. Means like without a radical rewriting or rechanging of the thinking of the policy, that you cannot do this, you cannot implement it. I think that's very clear. Go ahead. So what tangible outcome are you trying to achieve? The tangible outcome that we're trying to, actually I'm just going to address this in my positive matter. Because like, yeah, right, like I think there is a very clear issue. I, th I don't think we're going to have a debate on whether or not climate change exists. But like the sad reality of the matter is, that debate happened. In like the, in, in, in Congress, like in like in the worst possible place in the Senate, where you had literally about 49 percent of the senators agree that uh, uh, climate change was not caused by people. Like that's fucking ridiculous. I'm sorry. Like if there's something that needs to be done. Right? I think the way that politics works in the status quo is that there is a heavy disincentive to actually think about those issues. Right? Because the way that it works, if you want to get elected to Congress, if you want to get elected to a legislative body, you essentially go to lobbyists, you get funding, then you get elected, and then you essentially like become part of what's called the Iron Triangle. Right? Like you're promised something, what, quid pro quo? I think that's what it is. I don't know. 
Um, so, like, you know, like, you're gonna do something for me, I'm gonna do something for you. Like, Big Cole will back me, will back my, um, campaign, make sure that I'm successful under, uh, the understanding that once I'm elected to office, I will, uh, introduce and back policies that are beneficial to them, that won't stand in their way at the best possible po uh, uh, profit motive. Right? And it's, it like only gets worse as time goes on. Because nobody stops and says, hey, we need to think about these issues. These aren't things that we can necessarily sustain. So much so that NASA, like the people, uh, essentially, like the federally uh, created branch that are the experts on this field, are saying, stop, you can't do this, and have been con continually, continually ignored, right? Like it's that kind of cycle that essentially repeats itself. Like people just go back in, uh, into office under the premise that you know they will be beneficial to those you know um, big oil, big uh, coal, and whatever other co uh, um, you know uh, companies that decide they want to dump in some river in the back of Milwaukee. But, right? Like you know, um, like things that you know they do that are pernicious to the environment, that are harmful to the environment, but still uh, maintain their profit motive. Um, yeah, yeah, so how at all does your plan solve for lobbying? Right, um, yeah, it doesn't, I think, all to point, okay, hold on. It doesn't in a sense that, like, you, you don't necessarily have people in Congress that are now being elected that have, like, very, I guess, cognizant views of the environment, but I think what it also does is checks them. Like, I think when you have something at a very supreme level that can veto a policy like Keystone Excel that has no benefits in terms of the environment, actually has proven harms, and the scientific community has agreed that it has proven harms, you can have a veto, even if Congress says, yes, you can, the Supreme Court of the Environmental Sciences, I guess we'll call it, they say no, right? Like, it, you've never had that in politics. I think we solve for that. Um, and so essentially, by having... Uh, a court at such a high level, right? Like that don't necessarily, um, uh, that, that aren't, you know, um, that aren't, you know, like uh, mutually, I guess, dependent on lobbyists that don't have that incentive, that are completely independent, right? Much like the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court doesn't really care in terms of what big, big business wants, big, uh, lobby wants. Like I think having that body providing a check at least is a very good and beneficial step in the right directions. I don't think there are any harms to this, and if you can, bring them up. Um, but I think also it sends a very powerful symbol and a powerful message that first and foremost this will not be tolerated anymore, especially in politics. If you're going to introduce something that is blatantly bad for the environment um, and that benefits you, you're going to get called out for it, right, at the highest level of government. And then two, I think it sends a message that there is no longer a place for this kind of like iron triangle-y um, uh, paradigm of governments. Like you can't just get elected under the same paradigm. I think that when you have something in government where the government is taking a stance and saying that this body has enough power to um, uh, veto something on a very national level, um, you, you essentially send out the message that one, like, there is a place for this in politics, that the environment matters, the government cares, and this will not be tolerated anymore, and two, uh, well, I guess four, um, that essentially, like, uh, we've concluded as a society, just by implementing this policy, that, like, this no longer can take place. Right, for those pre reasons, and the fact that, like, I don't think there are any harms, and the long-term solvency of, like, uh, solving uh, the environmental crisis, I think we're very proud to propose this motion. I'd like to thank the member for his speech and now welcome the leader of opposition. <coughs> Ready? Mr. Speaker. The question you must ask yourself here today is when do we suspend democracy in order to achieve a policy goal? And we tell you that democracy is the value that you must uphold in this round today and that this is in fact not mutually exclusive with solving the harms that he brings up of the, uh, of the current environmental crisis, which we're not here to deny is a real thing. And that's what we're going to prove to you here today uh, with the point that this actually masks the harm. Two, this disempowers individuals. Three, this restricts innovation. And, uh, and four, is that this sets a precedent for 
bureaucracy over democracy and why this is actually a bad thing. But first I want to get into some rebuttal. Because Brooke directly asks him in a POI, what is your goal of this round today? And he does not have a clear answer to that. He tells you he's going to address it in his positive matter, but he doesn't actually get to that. Will this lead to better policy? Will this lead to best carbon pollution? Is, there act is the problem with the environmental crisis actually a problem of government policy in the first place? We do not get that out of the, uh, out of the PM speech. This is something that is lacking within the model. Two, we want to tell you that a large portion of his speech is just telling us why global warming is a big deal. Nowhere in our side of the house are we going to deny global warming is a big deal. The burden on side government is to prove to us why their model actually solves the harms of global warming, something that they, not, that they do not do. And third of all, the only impact that you get out of him is that this is symbolic action. Mr. Speaker, we are way beyond symbolic action with response to global warming, okay? Jimmy Carter put solar panels panels on the White House in the 70s. What did that lead to? Nothing, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's such a gigantic mischaracterization. I told you the example of Keystone Excel, where it had to go to a presidential veto in order for it to get struck down. Like, these are policies that get enacted every day. So his only example is something that has already been solved by, in his own question, a presidential veto. Okay, moving on. Okay, so here's what our positive matter is here today, okay? What you need to actually solve the environmental uh, harms is citizen buy-in, okay? You need citizen buy-in in order to achieve long-term political change because the real cause of the environmental uh, problem isn't government policy, as they would have you believe, but it's actually corporate behavior, okay? The way that you change corporate behavior in the long run is that you need the individual to feel that they are empowered, that they are important, that they can actually change this, okay? The problem is that when you have a... Uh, when you have... Uh, when, uh, blah, 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 blah. When you have just a Supreme Court body change policy as opposed to having the individual care about it, the individual feels that A, they don't matter, and B, the problem has been solved, okay? What this allows is this allows for corporations to continue practicing the policies that cause the harm to the environment in the long term, okay? So this is our first point, okay, is that this masks the harms, because the harms at the end of the day are things like oil spills, they're things like carbon pollution, they're things like fracking, they're not things like government policy that has been passed. At the, what this does is this just masks the harm. It tells tells us that, oh, we can have a Supreme Court body that can just come in and fix this, while well, at the end of the day it allows the root causes of the environmental problem to remain within the public sphere, and this is something that we must address if we want long-term change. Do not put a band-aid on the problem of the environment, okay? We are way beyond this. But two, this actually disempowers individuals. It tells the individual that their voice in a democracy doesn't matter, that something that they believe doesn't matter. What this leads to is that voter apathy. It tells them that it's like, oh, I don't need to continue voting for politicians who do believe that global warming is real. I don't need to, you know, use my dollar as a means to achieve change because, look, the government has already done this for me. When government, when we have uh, this belief that government can just come in and solve the problem, it disallows the individual to care about the problem. The caring about the problem is key to solving the problem, especially when it's so huge that it is something that's societal. And as a last point, I forgot to mention this in rebuttal, but they only leave their model to developing nations, but we know China is the problem here, so we still think that we're going to have problems in the third world of uh, every environmental harm, so that they give themselves this burden of solving the environmental crisis, but they still allow the main polluters to remain unaffected. They have not met their burden, and they simply cannot win the debate. I'll give you another chance. Yeah, the problem is even more rampant in China, where there is here, here. no incentive to stop doing so. I mean, like, this is, and the, like, the congressional bodies do not buy into this. But your model the doesn't address China, so how is that, how is that, like, relevant here today? Okay, so next what we tell you is this actually restricts innovation, because if you really want a solution, you need something like, you know, uh, algae fuel, or like something like desalinization, something radical, something different, something like building houses up off the ground as opposed to continue to explode, something like restricting, like, meat production, because we, we know that meat directly harms the environment, okay? These sort of innovative policies only come about from a public demanding these innovative policies. There is clear evidence in this, in the status quo, which is that when oil prices go up, we actually get more innovation in things like green technology because the public demands it. When the public feels that pain in their wallet, the public decides that we are going to uh, push for things like innovation in the long term, and that's where you actually get the solvency on our side of the house. When the public doesn't care, because the public has been told that they don't matter, that democracy doesn't matter, and that they are not important, they do not care for these innovative policies. That's what you get with the bureaucracy 
out of uh, out of sight government. And five, or uh, I don't know what number one, but this sets precedent for bureaucracy over dem over democracy. Okay, and we think that this is bad because bureaucrats don't always have the interests of the public at heart. He tells you that we are putting up a like bureaucratic uh, group of scientists, but there's clearly been shown in the status quo that there's even dissent among scientists about specific things of uh, of of global warming. Okay, and we think that there's clear evidence of bureaucracy not always solving the problems and us having a false belief that like technocrats can come in and solve problems in like the EU bailout, right? So like what happened is that Greece did all these horrible things, their sovereignty was taken away and it was given to things like the Troika and like the EU, okay? These technocrats couldn't solve the problem. The supposed experts aren't always the ones that know best, especially with things like policy because policy is more complex than just matters of environmental concerns. Policy includes different aspects of economic policy, it includes domestic policy, it includes foreign policy, and these are sometimes things that are over their heads. Why are we putting this group of people that only know about science and having them analyze all of our policies? We think that this is, uh, is, is foolish. So at the end of the day, what we bring you on-site opposition is that, is that this masks the real harm of the problem, which is corporate uh, corporate behavior, and we think that the real way to solve this is to empower individuals by valuing their vote in a democracy. We think that when you take away the democratic input of the citizen, you ultimately disempower them, you tell them that, they're, that they don't matter, and when they don't matter, they don't demand a change. And it is that demanding of a change that is necessary to actually achieving the long-term solvency on such a large problem that he actually gives you in his prime minister speech when he tells you all these harms. If this is a large problem, do not put a band-aid on the BP oil spill, Mr. Speaker. Instead, what we demand is large change, not masking of harms. At the end of the day, it's not small government policies that create uh, that create our environmental crisis. It's corporate behavior, and we think that that should be addressed. We don't think that symbolic speech, is uh, symbolic action is the solution. We think that real action is the solution, and that's what you get on our side of the house. Thank you very much. and he tells you that we have to change people's behavior for the long term to implement effective policy that has to do with global climate change. The issue we see in the status quo is that there's already apathy when it comes to climate change because half the people don't even buy it to begin with. So we think at that point you have to recognize that if you're going to implement changes that benefit the climate, sometimes you have to force those changes. And that's why you have a supreme check on governmental legislation in the first place. That's why you have the Supreme Court exist as an actor that says things like segregation shouldn't exist, that certain things need to be forced behaviors on the public to actually get the types of change that is necessary. So before I get into even further uh, a deconstruction of his material, let me tell you what my two points are going to be. Firstly, I want to look at the short-sighted nature of political action and democracy. And secondly, I want to look at the solvency or the impacts directly within this policy. But before I do so, let's analyze what we hear coming out of his speech. So he tells us that he supports the idea of democracy over what we're acting as bureaucrats uh, um, over implementation of policy that people have, say, voted for or people support. The issue we see is if you look to, say, an established democracy that by like the United States, where the head of like our environmental uh, um, operations is a guy who's a climate change denier who has no background or history in science. We think that's extremely harmful when you have that individual who heads committees, and then on top of that you have legislation that prioritizes economy over, say, the detriments that are going to affect us now and in the future. Sometimes you do need a body to exist to put a check on that. He says, well, we already saw for it because we have someone like Barack Obama vetoed vetoing Keystone XL. He's not going to be president for much longer. So if you have someone who's more radical in power in the future, you still need to have experts that exist to protect against this harm. And then he says that climate, or that climate change is not consensus among experts. We don't have consensus, so we shouldn't have these people heading it. That's okay. Even if you don't have full consensus on every single policy, that's why we have a Supreme Court. We have multiple ideas when it comes to studied science on climate change actually engaging in the policy that exists, determining whether or not that policy should be implemented or it should be vetoed. We think that's actually a benefit. You do get different ideas of people who have engaged in actual practice research rather than what we have now, simply a career politician doing in the short term what will benefit him to get reelected. 
which I'll get into more later. Anyway, he tells you that all we do is mask the harms. We don't get to the root cause of all of these harms. Yeah, we don't get to the root cause in status quo where we do nothing, where we allow this to continue, where we allow policy to be implemented because people think that economy in the short term is better than environmental impacts down the road. We don't think you change anything on his side, whereas under our policy, you start telling people you have to believe climate change exists because we're not going to let you affect pol create policy that harms the environment more. That's important in today's debate. We think that at the end of the day, a Supreme Court exists to be a check when people don't always know what's going to happen, when people aren't always well-educated, when the politicians are not always well-educated. So we think that's okay. He says that it stifles innovation. We don't think it stifles innovation. If this policy is going to have a huge environmental impact, it's probably not going to be a good type of innovation in that case. We should get rid of it and not allow it to be implemented. He, um, voter apathy. He tells us that people are going to be apathetic. Um, we still think at the end of the day it's better to not implement harmful policies than, say, to worry about something small like voter apathy, even though we don't think it really ends up being that big of a deal in today's debate. At the end of the day, sometimes you do have to have experts tell people that they may be wrong. We are okay with standing by that. We are okay if democracy becomes harmful to the people in the future to say no. So, um, actually, no, I will take your POI. Yeah, so they try and, like, paint that in the status quo, Congress is passing all these anti-environmental policies that are, that are being accepted by the president. Can they name one policy that has actually been passed that is horrible for the environment that this sort of magical Supreme Court could stop? Well, okay, so at the end of the day, if you go to any local area where they say engage in fracking, fracking, there's oftentimes governmental discussion on whether or not you should allow fracking to take place. We say, look at something also like Keystone XL. There are plenty of ideas of where this has come about. We think at the end of the day, if someone finds that fracking in a particular area is going to affect the groundwater that people are drinking, maybe that should be vetoed and people should not be allowed to actually include fracking as something that they do in that area. Anyway, short-sighted nature of political action. This is important to recognize when he talks to you about democratic ideology and how democracy, once it's been implemented, actually works. Oftentimes you see that politicians will do whatever they can in the short term to, say, get reelected. They won't take into consideration things in the long term, things that may impact down the road after they're no longer in office or that they can't actually see the tangible nature of. That's the problem with something like the environment. Politicians oftentimes don't pay attention to the degradation that happens because they can't actually see it happening in front of them, because they can't quantify perfectly the idea of temperatures rising year by year. So they ignore that issue. They ignore that impact. And instead, they implement policies that they think will be economically beneficial for them to get reelected and possibly maybe help their constituents for a short period of time until the well runs dry. We think that that shorted nature of democracy and of politics is something that we need to combat. You combat that by implementing a policy that takes into account the long term. Who is the best person able to account for the long term? The individual who is well studied in the issue of climate change, in the issue of environment. The individual who is published and peer reviewed, who recognizes the issues that may come about from a policy that a politician will not pay attention to because all he really cares about at the end of the day is possibly a little bit of help in the short term for an economy and definitely for getting reelected in the future. And we have to recognize you need to check on that. So what does this check do in terms of solvency? We think that you show, if you look to, say, Supreme Court issues in the past where the Supreme Court made a radical decision in, say, the United States, things related to race relations, you eventually do affect people's behavior when a, uh, when a body goes against what maybe the masses don't believe in the first place. So we do think you actually can get behavioral change to what, which is what they want at the end of the day, right? So we affect people's behavior, which makes people more likely to buy into the issue of climate change as being in existence. On top of that, we actually can stop policies that can harm people in the long term. If a policy is studied to be harmful to the environment, we now have an actor that definitively can decide, okay, it's harmful, let's veto it. That won't always exist if you have a president or a leader in a nation developing, developed, whatever it may be, who doesn't believe in that ideology. We think that this allows to stop harm in the now and in the future. Altogether, you have to recognize that there is a tangible impact to taking a policy that has been analyzed to show it may detriment the environment in the future and being able to stop it from being implemented at all through a veto. We think we get the tangible impacts, we get the behavioral impacts, and we win today's debate. Thank you, Matt, for the speech, and now I'd like to welcome the Deputy Leader of Opposition. The 
environment is important and the harms that occur to the environment are terrible. However, doing small steps does not create any long-term lasting change. We're in a time of disaster. We need radical change. And all the government side does is mask the clear issue. Instead of just having a vetoing power, which is reactionary, by the way, and still allows harms in the meantime, instead we need proactive policies and proactive movements from the grassroots area that creates actual radical change and changes the corporate creed. And that is my split today, which is radical change. Afterwards, I'll get into some rebuttal and show exactly how they do not do anything to solve their harms. If anything, they might make it worse. So first of all, my split, which is talking about radical change. It is kind of predicated on the notion of sound science versus the precautionary principle. So in sound science, you just say, hey, look, let's just try everything out. And like, if, if everything goes to shit, oh, well, we'll figure, we'll put in policies later on to, to uh, combat that. We see this notion that's occurring with uh, like uh, three parent children, like in Europe, they're saying, hey, this is probably, let's test it out first before you even allow this to happen. In the United States, well, yeah, I don't know, let's try out different clones. So we see that, especially with uh, environmental policies, we do not have any pro proactive steps that are radical. Instead, the only steps we kind of see are movements towards fracking, which is, hey, bad for the environment, and other movements like corn-based ethanol, which we think is bad additionally. All this is doing is a reactionary, uh, is, a, is predicated on the notion of sound science that it'll be okay and if it's bad, we'll fix it later. No, we need to have radical change and do something different. Laws are reactionary and so are so is their plan, which is just a vetoing from the uh, Supreme Court of environmental experts. We think that the veto, first of all, allows for harms to occur in the meantime, like you have bad corporations that are doing bad things or policies that may be bad, which by the way, most of the harms come from the private sector, not necessarily policies that the environment, uh, that the government is passing except for maybe Keystone XL pipeline which Obama vetoed. But additionally, people need to demand change and first of all, go vote. That's the democracy we're talking about. We're not talking about the specific politicians that can be, uh, cannot, that won't be reelected if we finally enable and uh, empower the uh, citizens to actually vote for people who want to create radical change for the environment. And they think that this is solved when you somehow have the Supreme Court that's going to do anything. I'm not, I'm not going to get it in my slip right now. And we think that the, the necessary uh, change needs to come from corporate behavior and what we need is to empower the grassroots movement and also different voters so that they can stop re-electing people who, do, who deny climate change. Like, why would you bring a snowball and somehow say climate change doesn't exist anymore? That's stupid. So their entire, uh, their impact that they bring up in the PM speech is that this is symbolic action, that we're taking a step uh, to support the environment. And we think that's exactly the problem, that this is symbolic action. People see this as symbolic. They think that the problem is solved, and that's just simply not the case. What we need is radical change. We need to stop having corn-based at corn-based es corn based ethanol, and instead do something like maybe algae biofuel, figure out desalination, completely dismantle corporations that can that can disrupt rivers, that can uh, that can pollute tenfold into the environment. You see, the United States is like four, has forty percent of the responsibility for pollution in the world. What needs to happen is radical change. What you get from the government side is a thing uh, is a symbolic action that tells people the problem is solved, does not empower them to fight back against uh, fight back against corporate greed, and third, mask the issue takes little changes and then makes people give up and stop. We see that this happened in the past with the Supreme Court when gay marriage protests stopped coming up as often and there, stopped, there was decreased LGBTQ rights because they thought the Supreme Court was going to handle the issue and instead what needs to happen is changing the socialization of individuals who seem to think that to, that it, to be part of the LGBTQ LGBTQ community is bad. We think that is terrible. Instead, we need to not rely on some bureaucracy to create change and empower individuals to get up and do so themselves. Go ahead. We need to prove why any of that is mutually exclusive. At least we provide some sort of stopgap measure to keep bad policy from being implemented while you encourage grassroots. I'm pretty sure my entire split was showing you how the symbolic action masks the issue and makes people think it's solved so they stop fighting back, they stop having grassroots movements, and they stop creating any radical change. Like my split was literally addressing her entire so on to some rebuttal and how they make everything worse. So they completely ignore all of Emilio's analysis of how this is actually corporate behavior and the individuals need to stop buying from those corporations that are doing bad things to the environment and radically change the system and have proactive laws instead of reactive, uh, reactive measures coming from a Supreme Court, not even the lawmakers, a bureaucracy that, uh, that is not even elected. So their argument is that, first of all, democracy doesn't work that, and that we need these experts to protect individuals. So first of all, she makes this argument like uh, Obama might be pro-environment, but if we have have, like, I don't know, a Republican president coming in the future, it's not going to be uh, good for the environment. We think this is ridiculous because Emilio's analysis is that we won't elect individuals who are uh, who have uh, anti-environmental stances unless uh, 
but if we are empowered, but they are disempowering them, thinking that the Supreme Court will actually solve the issue. So we're like, yeah, it's not a big deal if we have a Republican president in the future. We think that is worse in the long run. Additionally, like experts can also be, uh, uh, environmental experts can be pro-environment or anti-environment. You have an MIT professor who is an expert in environmental sciences who says that uh, climate change isn't real. So like you have somebody from MIT peer reviewed the same stuff, like the same argument can be on both sides. But additionally, <laughs> but additionally they say, the, Supreme, uh, the status quo is doing nothing, and the Supreme Court is a check. And I think my entire split addresses this argument, how the Supreme Court is moving uh, more progressively towards environmental change, but the Supreme Court is going to, think, is going to make people think that grass, grassroots movements do not need to uh, be as active because we have this bureaucracy that can check back. We don't need to worry as much anymore. Like this is kind of, uh, we think that this is bad in the long run because we think that the issue is solved. It's kind of the false generosity thing that Ferry talks about in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, I'll get to you in a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, time's almost up, so go ahead. Okay, so like, their whole case has so far been a critique on judicial review. I don't understand. Like, if you're going to go ahead and advocate for this, advocate for the dissolution of the Supreme Court as it is. Like, this is not exclusive to anything. I mean, I think we're specifically talking about environmental harms and what creates the most environmental change in the long run. A specific Supreme Court that deals with environmental issues is going to mask the problem. And I even give you an example of what sometimes the Supreme Court does stop grassroots movements with the LGBTQ community. So then they say that politicians are going to do what they can in the short term, uh, and, and we don't want to elect uh, politicians that might change uh, different directions. We think that the Supreme Court is not making policy, but rather reacting to different policies that have, uh, that have been passed that might be bad for the environment. Let's stop being reactionary and stop, start being proactive. Let's create radical change. Let's go towards algae biofuel. Let's go away from fracking and uh, corn-based ethanol. Additionally, they say that, uh, and we also think that policies, uh, we also think that in the long run, they mask the problem, we want cr radical change, they say maybe a little bit of change is going to solve these huge environmental harms that they bring up in the PM speech. At the end of the day, it's clear you have to have an opposition ballot when they don't do anything except mask the issue. I'd like to thank the Madam for her speech. I'd also like to remind everyone to please keep talking to a minimum. And I'd like to welcome the member of government to continue the case. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, you're not going to have scientists come and argue whether environmental change is a real problem or global warming is a problem. Yeah, that's an issue that needs to be discussed. But you're really going to have scientists who, who are going to be experts in, say, the biofuel mechanics of the new fuel plant that your company is trying to set up. And this expert will then be able to tell you what will the implications of such a fuel plant be on the place that it's set up in 10 years, in 5 years. How will the society be, uh, how will the society be affected because there's large water flooding, because the carbon emissions will increase significantly. And when experts like these can come to conclusions, that's when we believe we can get all of the benefits that you're trying to get on your side of the house. First off, before I get into my split about really why, why do we need experts because I don't think it was fleshed out well enough and the, and the impact of cross-national cross expertise, I'm going to go into some refutation. The big point we get from the previous speakers is the idea of proactive policy. Proactive by definition means you do something before it actually goes out and affects many people. So for instance, we are acting in a proactive way. That is, we are telling companies, companies, you're going to screw up by creating this massive power plant or this massive nuclear plant in a different country. Therefore, we are proactively preventing all of these, all of these damages if such a policy was passed by preventing it from going out. Therefore, we are preventing all of the harms that you want that you want to prevent on your side of the house. Do we need grassroots movement? Do we need people to be involved? Yeah, absolutely. It hasn't happened so far. It can happen. It doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. That's not our burden. But Mr. Speaker, there are other four points because that's what the last speaker told you. But they said it masks the harms. Corporations need to change endemically. They aren't so far, and that's why we force them to do it. The way such a policy works is co when, co when corporations and lobbyists and, and, and political entities come up with ideas for such bills, when, when you have a, a list of scientists who now collectively veto the bill, say, hey, we aren't going to allow it to get passed because it creates so many harms to the environment in multiple ways, therefore you need to rethink the way you think about your policy and your bills. That's when you create endemic change and the way people view their implications in the environment. This goes with the innovation argument as well, right? When you have bills saying such policies will create so much harm, therefore we are forcing you to think of new and innovative ways through which you can use biofuel, through which you can use renewable sources of energy, and that's important. 
And this uh, entire idea of disempowering individuals and democracy being heard at its root, that's complete rubbish. We aren't changing the way democracy works. You're still going to have politicians who are, who are making these laws. If in the event that they screw up so majorly, you have some sort of review or some sort of veto, we think that's okay. We don't have these scientists making laws at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker. We just have them saving democracy's ass when democracy really messes up and we think that's okay. Yeah. So I think like the fact is the subjectivity of the environment, because everything from exhaling to like uh, uh, like totally like swapping the environment hurts the environment. The subjectivity specifically on the environment yeah. can be corrupted by politicians and by lobbyists, specifically on these panels of Supreme Court. So, so, so this question of, you know, why won't scientists be affected by such sort of subjectivity? And the reason for that is, especially compared to politicians who can easily be affected, scientists these are people who worked in their field for many, many years. I'm assuming this is someone who spent his or her life working on the me mechanisms of how a dam in Southeast Asia would work and how it would affect <laughs> fish in that area. He's probably very passionate about what he's doing. What does that mean? He probably has a very high academic ref reputation that he really cares to maintain. Are there people who might be aff affected by lobbying? Sure, but are most people going to work together to get the best possible outcome in order to, to ma maintain the environment that they so um, so closely care about? Probably. Let's get into my, my positive matter. No, no. Oh. Um, this idea of cross-country cross impact, because we've talked about global warming is a problem. But global warming or, or this environment change is something that happens in the United States of America, but those people in Bangladesh really suffer when, they, when, they, when their houses uh, get flooded as a result of it, right? What happens is when a, com when a company from the United States creates a nuclear power plant or a com company in Japan creates a nuclear power plant that really affects someone sitting in, say, Somalia or another country, that's, those are the real impacts of global warming. What happens to our policy? <laughs> We believe that politicians only focus on their constituencies and their personal country because their big goal in the long run is to maintain their power and to constantly get re-elected. We believe that scientists have different motivations because we've told you that they have been so involved in their field for so long and as experts in their field, they are at least more likely to care a lot more about the environment. They're going to more objectively look at the outcome of a certain bill or policy. How's it going to impact the people there from an environment standpoint? What does this tell you? Therefore, if there are certain bills that are really going to cause harm, not now, not in five years, but in 10 years, because these experts can judge that and they declare it to be extremely dangerous, they're going to veto such a bill. What happens as a result of which global communities, which would have been damaged most by the passing of such a bill, are benefited. And we think that's really important. What is the big impact with something like this? Because we've had policy and environmental change and the United States has done absolutely nothing with it. And the global community, we keep talking about it, but no action has been done. This would be your first tangible step. What also happens is it sends that very symbolic message to the rest of the world that hey, we, the United States, are now actually taking steps to help the global community deal with things such as environmental change, global warming, and the implications of, of, of our policies. Yeah. Yeah, so how does stopping bad policies actually create good policies, okay? I think that's the link that you're missing, and Brooke already addresses that when she talks about reactionary versus proactive policies. I, I don't know if it creates good policies, it creates better policies and prevents these really bad policies from being passed, because every time it's something that's so bad, it's thrown out of the window and you have to start from scratch. Yeah. I thought that was pretty self-explanatory. But what, what, what is the real impact of something like this, right? You actually now become a meaningful negotiator who is who who can be seen as someone trustworthy in this global discussion on environmental changes. Because the smaller countries, because the Indias and Sudans or whoever who, who really don't have much of a say in what's happening around the world, will now say that, hey, the United States of America is making a conscious decision within its country to curb the effects of its companies on, on the rest of the world. That's pretty important. Because, Mr. Speaker, we've told you that these experts are people who care about their field. These are people who can act proactively rather than reactively, as the last speaker told you, because right now the way society functions is you have, you have bills that are passed, you have companies that, are take, that take advantage of it, reap profits, reap benefits, and five years down the line you realize you really destroy the environment and you're, and you're dealing with legal, with legal issues. Now, we solve for that when we, take care of, uh, when we take care of experts in the field. What happens as a result? You have better policies passed from an environmental standpoint. You force companies to innovate more so that they can actually um, um, stay true to these guidelines and you, and you save the environment in, some, in some, some, some way or the other. That's why we think you need a vote for closing our class. Thank you. I'd like to thank the member for his speech and now welcome the member of opposition. I think what is missing in this, today's debate is exactly what the like, climate change is and how you actually measure it. 
Now, there's like multiple ways you can say it, and most of what these effects are in like global warming is actually long-term effects. We think that the best people to decide whether or not these long-term effects outweigh the short-term effects are those individuals appointed by the constituents, specifically uh, <coughs> politicians and, and the such. But we think that the problem is when you have scientists, right? When you have scientists who, anything that we do, right? So like this, the second that I'm exhaling produces CO2, which it has an effect on the environment. We think that that is very subjective. Yet the fact is that everything in the environment relies on feedback loops, and that these feedback loops can be ranging from anything from a thousand years to tomorrow. Looking at them, when you have such a subjective thing, and then you have such subjective individuals on the appointed to the Supreme Court, that you can have a large bit of corruption. And that's what we're going to bring you on side closing op uh, opposition, is that there's a large bit of corruption just because of the nature of subjectivity, specifically of these scientists that are somehow appointed, somehow different than like the Supreme Courts do. But first, let's get into like a little bit of rebuttal. So first. We get this idea of like scientists are dedicated and they don't want to like ruin their reputations, so we think that like they like act better. We think that's actually false, right? We think that like politicians are also experts in their field. They also don't want to ruin their reputations. What do they do? They still take bribes. They still take things that are against their will to make bad policies. Now, what does this actually mean? This means that you're not you're just taking like this pseudo, uh, like you just take like this blanket, put it over these uh, people, and think that the problem is solved. The problem isn't solved. These scientists themselves are then going to be lobbied by companies like Monsanto, like um, in, which like already have members in the FDA, already have members in the EPA, so we think that like ultimately we have that them are still going to have members trying to lobby for their specific uh, causes. Secondarily, you, you have to look at the fact that the environment is so subjective. We think that when a scientist can say, yeah, that breath that you just took did somehow affect the environment, so therefore we shouldn't pass that policy, we think that when you, have, you give scientists that much power and the fact that they are lobbied by these companies who want to pass certain things over another, we see that then you construe the facts of what is being passed for this actual harm of the environment and what is actually being passed to save the environment open hands. So the problem is, is the corruption exists in the status quo where a politician is considering the short term and his personal benefits. At least now we have experts who are buried in that field to discuss the issue and determine a veto. So I think that we already have that in the status quo, like the EPA, who actually direct the politicians to make the policies, yet we think that we don't get any solvency. I think you're like referring back to like opening the argument and saying that if you just put this like cloud as if you solved it, but you don't actually solve that. I think they do a good job rebuttaling that, so I'm not going like, to go into that. So then we get like the arguments of like because they're academically represented, they don't want to hurt their uh, reputation. But we think that only that gives them an incentive to actually hurt their reputation. We think that because they're not in the public's eye, we think that when the public does not get to check them like the politicians do, they have more incentive to take that bribe because of the fact that public are not interested. We think that when public is interested in policies, that the best policies will be made. If we look at like the BPOS bill, we can all agree that the BPOS bill was a disaster. But what people don't know is the fact that because of the people were so outraged that policy was then enacted by Congress to stop this. We see that there was two new reforms on the, fra uh, the uh, drilling process that actually uh, would better affect the environment later, but people don't talk about that because the only the people who are affected want that change, and you don't get any ch like fake change unless you affect people. And we think that on side opposition, we show that people are affected and people can advocate best for this and not try to hide the problem opening up. So you'd rather have like major environmental crises happen and to sort like some sort of policy change? And like it's not that it's not that you know subjective. We have metrics. We say like this is not within tolerance. You okay. can't do it. So I think like another thing that's subjective, like a solar panel actually causes great effects to the environment short term. But looking long term, it actually greatly helps the environment. So if you want like to innovate like new solar panels, you have to then go up to this like panel and say, look, we want to make these products, but the fact is like they might hurt the environment short term, but long term they affect uh, are better for it. So we think that the lobbying then stops companies to actually innovate for these products because they're being stopped because it has some de detriment short term that is very subjective, specifically to how the science view and how the science are important uh, uh, are important. Appointed. Now let's get into like some positive matters. So like we bring you the corruption argument, right? We think that like big companies will lobby more for scientists because a scientists are out of the public eye because of the fact that they are viewed as like specialists in their field. Just as they say, they say that like, scientists always make right decisions because they're specialists in their field. We say that is wrong, specifically because of the subjectivity of environment. We say things like Monsanto is able to get members on the EPA and on the FDA. That that, that ultimately shows that it is done and will continue at, under their plan. Secondarily, we see that we we think that there is no uh, impact on systems society because society is what ultimately enacts change, I said like opening opposition. We think that when you show society that these individuals are somehow solving the problem and that they have the best discretion, you think that you then get more companies trying to vie for that 
for that spot on the supreme uh, on that like supreme court. Secondarily, we think that the, there's an inherent problem with the veto itself. We think that the, the giving the ability for that one scientist to say no that, that affects a, the uh, problem short term, so therefore it can't happen. When that other scientist thinks that ultimately that'd be the best thing for the environment long term, we think that because of how subjective it is and how you can have that one veto to completely stop innovation, completely stop the better effects of the environment, we ultimately do not want this plan enacted back half. Thank you. Um, you have politicians who are reporting to their constituents and their goal is to remain in power. Scientists don't have such a goal. Which group do you think is going to be more subjective? Okay, so I think the scientists also do have that goal because they have to stay on that court. So we think that like ultimately they want to be making what gets them on that court the longest because that, in their mind, gives them more effect because like the ultimate goal of science is to be recognized, right? That's why you like try to publish and try to research because you want to, like, to make something that's innovative. Right? So we think that when people are viewed in the public eye and the goal of science is to actually be in this public eye on this Supreme Court, that that is a, is a reason for like this corruption, specifically that you get because of the fact that uh, these companies would like vie for this spot of this vetoing power. We also think that finally, that because of this vetoing power, we think that um, ultimately like, you, you don't have to have multiple members on this Supreme Court to be corrupted. We see that one corrupt member on this like Supreme Court is inherently going to disrupt the entire policies. We can see this with like, like farming degradation, right? Like, even farming is inherently like at some level harmful to the environment. But we think that the long-term outputs uh, uh, out outputs are actually uh, better than the inputs. So we think that ultimately, like it's so subjective that you can't have these scientists who are then lobbied to uh, actually make these decisions. So what do we bring you on closing opposition? We think that ultimately, because of the subjectivity and how the the specific ideas of the environment can be construed, you think that there's ultimately going to be more corruption, more vying by companies like Monsanto to get members on that to veto the process, which ultimately hinders pro ultimate progress and ultimately leads to a world where we think the problem is gone when in actuality the problem is never solved and it leads to a, a worse environment long term and that's what we give you on the side uh, closing off this side of the problem. Like to thank the member for his speech and welcome the government whip. Mr. Speaker, I don't have a lot in common with Ted Cruz. I do have in common with him that I am not a scientist. But unlike him, and this is where Ted Cruz and the opposition bench agree, I believe that it's important to consult with scientists when making important decisions that they have particular expertise on. And instead of simply consulting them and throwing their opinion away, like we do in the status quo, we believe it's important to bring those who have technocratic experience to the forefront. Mr. Speaker, we're going to show you, and we're going to show you how we have shown, on government side, that we best solve for policy. Like how we achieve the best policies for the environment, how we don't have any of the harms that we talk about on the government. So firstly, rebuttal. I, wanna, I just want to briefly talk about one of the, like, the main argument we hear from opening, just because I think it's hilarious, right? Like the masks action point. If governments start doing things to like, stop environmental harms, then people won't do anything. And like environmental harms will continue. Uh, well, then let's just get rid of the EPA, right? Like, why, I, like, they give absolutely no rationale as to why it is that government action makes it so that people won't act. And they talk about, like, democracy is going to fall apart. Well, no, it's not. We're not a pure democracy anyway. Yada, yada, yada. Mavarin already responded to that very sufficiently. I don't feel the need to go into it. So let's go over the main thing that we get from, like, the bottom half, right? That scientists are going to be incredibly subjective, right? Because you know scientists and your professors, right? They are the most subjective people that you've ever met in your life. Whereas Ted Cruz is a beacon of reason and logic. Like, he is never going to be swayed by any interest ever. And, like, politicians are never, ever swayed by corporate money. That's complete rubbish, Mr. Speaker. Let's explain why. Firstly, we would tell you that there's an inherent difference based on the incentive structure that exists for scientists as compared to politicians. They say that like scientists want recognition. We'll concede to some extent that that's true, but we also think there's an inherent difference than a politician who, by the way, also wants recognition a lot. Like, look to how they like they structure their committees, and a politicians try and get to advance as like ranking members of committees, and then like make higher election bids, career politicians. And we think that there's an inherent difference in the incentive structure that exists, but we'd also tell you that scientists have additional education, and the expertise that they bring to the field is completely different. Insofar as they have an inherent burden based on their, uh, their field to, to uphold 
standards in a way that's different. So then we get this analysis, right, that like, oh, well, they'll become beholden to corporate interests once we create this position. Mr. Speaker, we think that that's fundamentally untrue. They talk about the FDA, but we think that like, insofar as scientists are, would be, the scientists would be subject to confirmation hearings in the Senate, like all of the money that Monsanto starts to give them, or like that other groups start to give them, would become public knowledge. Like we're not worried about that. And like justices can't accept money like that anyway. So, that's, so that issue is completely solved once the court is created. So I'm gonna go over a few key issues. Like what's the role of experts as compared to politicians? What type of, and what type of effect do we think this has on policy? I'll actually start with the latter, because I think this is crucial. The big critique that we've heard up and down the opposition bench is that we don't have solvency on our side. Like, we're not going to have any changes in policy. We tell you that that's fundamentally untrue based on the nature of this committee and like, of this court and how it would be structured. Insofar as scientists would be the ones on it and they would be the ones who would evaluate like, the differences in policy, we think that's fine. Like, they say, well, there are differences in scientists. Well, we're okay with the scientists having different opinion, right? Like, that's how it works on the Supreme Court, too. We think it's okay for scientists to have different opinions and for all of those opinions to come at the same time. That's completely fine. But Mr. Speaker, what we think is really crucial here is that we have two key impacts. Lauren tell, tells you about both. The first is that this prevents bad policies from coming to light. But the second, Mr. Speaker, is insofar as a politician, as, a, as an actor, says, I know that if I pass this policy, and if I can pass this policy because of all the money I have, because of the influence I have, if I am able to do so, but I know that this Supreme Court of Environmental Sciences is going to reject it, then they have a fundamentally different interest in mind, right, Mr. Speaker? What happens is they have to completely change how that policy works, and they have to change how it's written. Because they have to include feasibility now as a new metric. What does that do, Mr. Speaker? It moderates environmental policy. So even if you dis even if you like buy their argument that like we're not gonna stop bad policies, which is like really awkward because frankly on their side they don't stop them at all, and we like if we stop a few, that's a net benefit. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we tell you that we moderate policies in the long run. Because individual politicians then have to change the way that they structure their policies to not just be beholden to corporate interests or even to their constituents, but to actually make sure that they have a positive environmental impact. Actually, I'll take you. Yeah, yeah, So the passing of Obamacare ended calls for universal health care. Dodd-Frank reform ended calls for banking reform. Hell, the New Deal ended like the socialist left in the United States. When you pass small reform, it masks deep-seated issues. When your opening team has already told you that it's a deep issue, this is not something that we can do to solve environmental don't create good policy. Okay, so we think that the <laughs> fundamental difference, right, is based on the status quo. Look to the amount of action that the United States government is conducting in the status quo. If there was a movement in the United States that we would like suddenly be throwing out as a result of this, we might even agree with you. But Mr. Speaker, insofar as the movement in, politi in like political circles is about evenly split, we tell you that you achieve much broader impacts on our side when you have governmental policy trying to make the difference. So Mr. Speaker, why do we believe experts are inherently better? And this is some of the analysis that Lauren gives you, right? Lauren tells you that experts, insofar as they have particular backgrounds and education and expertise in their field, are better qualified to make these decisions than politicians. Like, they're not beholden to the same level of, su of, of subjectivity, and they're not beholden to the consistent type of repeat review that's needed for a politician. Like, insofar as a House of Representatives member consistently has to generate money for their re-election, insofar as they consistently have to look to public approval, we tell you that these positions are better, because they're not subject to those same constraints. Mr. Speaker, maybe some of the politicians in the status quo who exist uh, who, who are against climate change reform don't actually feel that way. Like it's actually, we think it's totally possible, but we think that a lot of their constituents certainly do, and we think that they have to, they, that they certainly need to change their stance to some extent to be able to continue to govern. We tell you that insofar as justices don't have the same burdens because they don't have to keep getting reelected, that that's sufficient. That's what causes the change in environmental policy because not only their expertise, but the fact that they're not consistently elected, we think. Uh, result in substantial difference. So Mr. Speaker, what have we told you? We told you that this masks action argument is absurd because otherwise it would apply to like all environmental policy. We told you that the harms that we hear about on the opposition, on like bottom opposition, don't make any sense because what we actually do is we, uh, we would vet these judges through a, through a strict process. We tell you that the role of experts is particularly different insofar as they have different qualifications, but they're not beholden to the same interests. And we tell you that this results in a moderation of environmental policy, which is why closing government has won the debate.
sum up today's round in three main points. First, I'm going to tell you why environmental, why significant environmental impacts is extremely subjective and why this is actually super harmful with the government's plan. Secondly, I'm going to tell you why more uh, symbolic message is not going to be as effective as more practical means which we get in the status quo and which we can increase in the status quo. And thirdly, I'm going to tell you why this actually leads to more corruption um, with more corruption within, like under their plan to get more corruption basically. Okay, so firstly, environmental, <laughs> envir significant environmental impact. That is subjective, right? Like how are we going to define significant? How are we going to define the impact, right? It's basically a group of scientists who are going to decide whether or not this is worth it. We think that there are going to be many different opinions within this group of people and that all it takes is one person to decide that it's not going to be worth it, right? And this is exactly what Brad tells you because he says, um, because he says that this is too much power for like one individual, right? It takes one scientist to literally curb like <laughs> our years of work and like drawing up plans of like a company, right? It takes one person to say like, hmm, maybe it's not worth it. And we think that in like that just opens the door for lobbying. But I'll get that to my next point. No. So I think it's too much power for one individual, right? Because we do, and we don't think these individuals within the Supreme, um, within the Supreme Court of Scientific Experts are going to be like, they're not as um, subject to public approval, right, as like politicians are. So they're not as likely to like respond to the needs of public as politicians are. Brad gives you the example of solar panels, and he says that how, although this has, they make, to build solar panels has a lot of short-term environmental impacts, the long-term environmental impacts are actually better, or could be argued to be better, right? We think that disagreements like this are going to happen within this body, and again, it only takes one person to veto this to throw out the entire plans that actually could lead to a lot of long-term environmental benefits, right? It takes one person. Yeah, I'll take your point, actually. Okay, so I, I think largely the analysis that my partner brought as to the importance of judicial review, especially in a topic that one has failed to be represented in government, is largely missed. Could you please respond as to why you're opposed to a body uh, checking those types of regulations? Yeah, no, I'll definitely get that into my third point about the corruption, right? So secondly, we don't think that a symbolic message is like the answer to this, right? We think that more practical things. Because we think that after a company has spent time and money and resources developing plans and then and only then can they take this to a body to like ask for approval we think this is completely ridiculous right we think that having guidelines in place before doing all this before doing all the planning by having like fines or further regulations the more practical things which is what brad tells you is actually solves we think that this is much more like beneficial and like more efficient than kind of being like well we'll see maybe after when you're done if we maybe think that this is significant or not right we just think that's like completely like illogical we're not we're very confused like why you think that work we think that there needs to be like better clarification on the model and like why this isn't going to happen and why companies aren't going to like waste like millions of dollars in resources and then just like get vetoed right and so we think that again like guidelines that happen before the planning regulations fines things that we do within the status quo that we can increase within the status quo ultimately are a much better solution to the problem than just like having this veto right because we don't think um, that this like symbol symbolic thing that they bring to you has like worked in the past, right? We don't think it has, and we think that more practical, more tangible things like guidelines are going to be more effective. Bottom half. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about the cross cross national benefits that we talked about? This is the first time you're, you're making policy that actually affects and helps other countries. I'm not. I don't understand your PLI. Okay. Third, corruption. <laughs> I'll let give you another chance to clarify in a little bit. Okay. Third, corruption. We think that lobbying and an um, we think that they don't solve for lobbying with this plan. We actually think what they do is they increase lobbying because now all you need is one person with one veto to stop policy, right? And we think that things like fines, we think that things like guidelines that are like blanket policies that go over all companies are much less subject to corruption, right? We think that when you have things like it's not, it's wrong for this company to go ahead with this plan, but thi but like this company is not also subject to those same guidelines because they haven't been brought between this body, that this opens the door for more corruption. Because we think things like big oil companies, we think things like refineries have like a lot of money, right? They have like a lot of lobbying powder, power. And we think that it's like, 
like as I know that they say like oh these people like care about the environment but like yeah, my, like my partner said right like we think that like there are people with jobs all the time that actually care about what they're doing but they're still subject to lobbying they're still subject um, to corruption because we don't just think that like everybody always within all these companies and within the um, Supreme Court of Scientific Experts are not going to be subject to like influence from companies that have a lot of money, right? And my partner brought to you Monsanto, who like literally they have like people within the EBA and the FDA that are like working for them. Like that's crazy. If they can infiltrate that, we think that is going to be pretty easy for huge oil companies to be able to gain some like stronghold, some foothold within um, within like the Supreme Court of Scientific Efforts, right? So we think that again, this veto is actually what gives way to much more corruption than blanket fines, blanket regulations, because those are imposed on all companies and they're more practical because they are imposed um, like before the plants have been done, right? And we think that um, when certain companies like have the power to like literally lobby like to, to like get a scientific effort to like veto like a competitor's plan that we think that this is like extremely harmful and we don't think that you get this in the status quo, right? We literally think that this opens the door hugely for much more corruption and when you get this corruption, when you get certain bigger companies getting more stronghold and getting more um, like doors open and more ability to do things than other companies, we don't think that this actually solves for like the environment, right? We don't think that this is going to somehow, that this is going to lead to like less environmental, um, less environmental impacts because you're still going to have people getting away with it you're still going to have people getting you're still going to have companies getting away with it you're still going to have get, have companies abusing it and we think this is extremely harmful we think that practical more blanket fines um, and regulations ultimately are going to be what reduces the amount of in like significant environmental impacts right we don't just think that this like veto is good so what did he bring you brad literally told you it's too subjective to be left into the hands of one person Practicality is going to work much better than symbolically, and blanket fines, blanket um, regulations are going to be much more effective than like the corruption that the door is opened with through veto. Proud to you. Thank you, Donna. I'd like to invite the creators to uh, cross the house and one final round.